From racist archetypes in The Shining to transphobia in the 80s cult classic Sleepaway Camp, there are plenty of reasons to cringe when watching some of our favorite older horror flicks. Here are some horror movies that haven't aged too well. There's definitely a cult following for the conjoined twin horror flick, Basket Case, but its final scene ruins whatever twisted joy could otherwise be found. Oh God, Dwayne, something awful's happened. Basket Case follows conjoined twins Dwayne and Belial, who were separated by a trio of doctors at an early age. Throughout the movie, they hunt down and kill each of them, one by one. <laughs> Basket Case has its fair share of dark humor, and even some of its murders are played for laughs. The problem comes when Belial attempts to rape Dwayne's girlfriend, Sharon. Belial, whose hatred of the world has been somewhat understandable, crosses the line from being a bitter misfit to an actual monster. Any sympathy for the character goes right out the window, and is only made worse when Belial kills Sharon after she tries to fight him off. While some viewers might find humor in a misshapen creature with no legs trying to rape someone, the scene is gut-churning and comes out of nowhere. It's exploitative at best and downright leering at worst, making the whole thing feel even more horrendous. The shifting tones and B-movie grizzle of Basket Case both age the film, but nothing makes it unwatchable quite like that ending sequence. Rape isn't just a plot point, and it certainly shouldn't be a punchline. It's a real shame, too, because the gonzo weirdness of Basket Case is a lot of fun, and this movie could have been a cult classic to love. Vincenzo Natale's 2009 film Splice has a repulsive reputation. It follows the groundbreaking exploits of two married geneticists, played by Adrian Brody and Sarah Pauly, whose primary interest involves splicing animal DNA and making uncanny hybrids for scientific study. Their prized creation is Dren, a humanoid female who also possesses backward-bending legs, retractable wings, and a long, fleshy tail with a stinger. Needless to say, the couple's version of Frankenstein's monster comes with equally disastrous consequences. What makes Splice so enduringly controversial are the film's sex scenes, all of which toy with abhorrent human taboos of incest, rape, and pedophilia. One of these exchanges involves Dren secreting a pheromone in order to seduce her adoptive father, who succumbs to the scent. Though this scene is certainly hard to stomach, it's just scratching the surface. The film's climax involves Dren morphing into a male to rape and impregnate Elsa. Though Dren is killed during the ghastly act, Elsa becomes pregnant and chooses to carry the resulting hybrid seed to term, after being offered a hefty sum by the scientific community. Easily one of the ickiest films of its era, some viewers will find that the film's shocking elements outweigh any potential commentary on eugenics or whatever it was the filmmakers were trying to say. Sam Raimi's The Evil Dead was groundbreaking in a lot of ways, paving the way for indie horror throughout the 1980s. However, one scene probably should have been left on the cutting room floor. The hyper-violent romp had no shortage of blood, guts, and gore, but it also has a completely unnecessary rape scene. The first victim of the titular Evil Dead is Cheryl, who is chased through the woods before being sexually assaulted by a tree. But the tree's Ash. Hey, no. Don't you see, Ash? They're alive! The sequence is graphic, focusing on Cheryl's abject terror as vines hold her limbs apart. She tries to cover her naked flesh, and the vines yank her hands away. It's one of the more intense assault sequences out there, despite the fantastical elements. In an interview with the San Diego Reader, Raimi expressed his regret over the scene. I think it was unnecessarily gratuitous and a little too brutal. My goal is not to offend people. It is to entertain, thrill, scare, make them laugh, but not to offend them. It's unfortunate that the 2013 reboot also included a tree rape sequence, though the director was allegedly required to include it by a producer. At least the Star series Ash vs. Evil Dead gave us some justice for Cheryl, with Sanweiss returning in the role and having a few choice words about her experience in the forest. The Evil Dead is an all-time horror classic, but that scene is totally unnecessary. Horror director Eli Roth has been very open about his love of cannibal films, even going so far as to casting Ruzero Diodato, the director of Cannibal Holocaust, to play a cannibal member of the elite hunting club in Hostel 2. In 2013, Roth finally made his own cannibal film, The Green Inferno. 
inspired by the explosion of Italian cannibal films of the late 1970s and early 1980s. Roth chose to format The Green Inferno similarly to Cannibal Holocaust by featuring a film within a film of streamed footage. The film follows a group of environmental activists who plan a trip to the Amazon rainforest to try and stop a petrochemical company from deforesting the area and displacing the indigenous tribes by streaming footage to raise awareness of their cause. Unfortunately, much like the filming of Cannibal Holocaust, there were a number of ethical and humanitarian concerns that weren't taken into consideration while Roth was filming. This whole thing was a mistake. The Green Inferno was heavily criticized by Survival International, who felt the film reinforced neocolonialism and perpetuated stigmas against indigenous peoples living in voluntary isolation by portraying them as savage. Typically, cannibal films are meant to critique the white savior behavior of colonialists, but because of the film's extreme nature, the film comes off as far more critical of indigenous tribes, portraying them as nothing more than unintelligent and dangerous. Roth dismissed these claims, believing that corporations continually tear apart indigenous communities regardless of how indigenous people are portrayed, and called their criticisms, quote, misdirected anger and frustration. The film remains banned in many countries due to its extreme depictions of blood, violence, and gore. Not unlike its unofficial namesake, Nosferatu is pretty xenophobic. More specifically, it's incredibly anti-Semitic. Nearly all of Europe leading up to and including the early 1920s was a hotbed of anti-Semitic rhetoric, influencing a great deal of the public's social and political engagement. The Dreyfus Affair started in 1894, and the Beer Hall Putsch would happen the year after Nosferatu was released. We all know what happened throughout Europe after that. Dracula was notoriously xenophobic, emphasizing some of the more racist anxieties prevalent in 19th century English society including the fear of encroachment by foreigners. Count Dracula himself was the personification of those fears. Director F. W. Murnau's vision of Count Orlok took Dracula a step further. Where the latter could shapeshift into a bat or a wolf, Murnau opted to have Orlok transform into a rat, a racist image for Jewish people at the time. But if one were to determine what attributes the Jews share with the beast, it would be that of the rat. They were also often referred to as vermin, carriers of pestilence and consumers of all that lay before them. Orlok spends the film buying up all the property he can get his hands on and spreading disease wherever he goes. On top of this, Orlok's physical features were overtly anti-Semitic, pulling from the countless anti-Semitic caricatures that predate the film's release, not to mention those that would come after. Eventually, this would include the Nazi party and be used as anti-Semitic propaganda, his long fingers, hunched back, and elongated hook nose have been used for centuries to dehumanize Jewish people. In 1922, they were used to sell movie tickets, and no one batted an eye. Love it or hate it, The Shining is one of the most famous horror films of all time. Based on the novel by Stephen King and directed by industry giant Stanley Kubrick, The Shining has been both lauded and heavily criticized since it was released in 1980. Considering the film's affecting atmosphere, early adoption of cutting-edge film technology, and striking cinematography, the praise is well-deserved. However, when you factor in the stilted characters, racist tropes, and Shelley Duvall's horrific experiences working with Kubrick, the criticism rings true. The film tells the story of the Torrance family, who move into the Grand Overlook Hotel after Father Jack Torrance is hired as the off-season caretaker. While things are finally starting to look up for the Torrances, the family we meet in the beginning of the film is already in crisis. Jack's wife Wendy and their son Danny have been physically and mentally abused by Jack, who is an alcoholic. Of course, things take a turn for the worse as the solitude and ghostly spirits in the hotel itself drive Jack mad. Danny and Wendy's only saving grace is Danny's magical powers, which include premonitions and telepathy. Those magic powers connect Danny to the hotel chef, Dick Halloran, who embodies the racist trope of the magical black character in King's story. Halloran is portrayed as a tour guide for and a savior of the Torrance family, a minimized role that only shows Halloran in their service. He's also the first and only character killed on screen, which recalls another racist horror trope. The well-earned criticism doesn't end there. Shelley Duvall has described the overwhelming emotional intensity Kubrick required on set, 
as well as the hundreds of takes he demanded. Essentially, it seems like an arduous process that targeted Duvall more than the rest of the cast. Don't sympathize with Shelley. The Shining might be an important horror movie, but parts of it feel as old and neglected as the halls of the Overlook Hotel. To say The Silence of the Lambs is a beloved film is an understatement. It's pretty safe to assume that anyone who regularly watches movies has seen it, and chances are you've seen at least a few of the parodies that are scattered throughout pop culture as well. It puts the lotion on its skin or else it gets the hose again. The film has also been turned into a spoof musical, spawned a successful franchise of films, and there surely would be no Hannibal TV series if it had not been for the success of this film. The film follows Jodie Foster's FBI agent in training, Clarice Starling, as she races against the clock to solve the case of a possible serial killer called Buffalo Bill, seeking assistance from a gifted psychologist named Dr. Hannibal Lecter, who is locked away for his own history of murder and cannibalism. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Today, the conversations surrounding The Silence of the Lambs are focused on the propaganda of a film glorifying FBI agent Clarice Starling, or the blatant transphobia of the characterization of Jamie Gum. The film had its fair share of protests in 1991 through 1992, with the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation and gay critics believing audiences would read Jamie Gum as a gay man and treat gay people in real life accordingly. As our language continues to evolve surrounding gender identity and the transgender experience, so too have our discussions surrounding the film. Unfortunately, the public consciousness's view of trans people was greatly influenced by the portrayal of Jamie Gum, with some conservative pundits even nicknaming anti-trans legislation Buffalo Bills. It's important to remember that although Silence of the Lambs is an absolute masterclass in filmmaking, its problematic legacy still shines as brightly as all of the trophies it earned. Released in 1983, the cult classic Sleepaway Camp is best remembered as a low-budget disaster featuring wildly inappropriate adult camp staff, the cruelest preteen campers ever captured on film, and an infamous ending that has been the subject of debate for almost 40 years. The love and following for the film lie predominantly with the campy nature of this summer camp slasher, but its shocking and downright problematic ending solidified its cult status. The film follows a simple slasher formula, where an unseen force kills campers and counselors one by one in progressively weirder ways. When the killer is revealed, we see the teenaged Angela standing nude and groaning like an animal, and as camp counselor Ronnie exclaims, oh God, she's a boy. As it turns out, Angela is not Angela, but her brother Peter, who is forced to live as a girl by his Aunt Martha. The ending is wildly problematic for perpetuating the dangerous transgender myth, implying that Peter and Angela's deceased father was a gay man and was therefore not allowed to raise children, and also for showcasing the fully nude body of an underage child. On the surface, Sleepaway Camp is absolutely a transphobic and homophobic movie, but the film also serves as an incredible metaphor for how forcing gender roles onto someone that doesn't align with who they are is dangerous. Even in the ugliest moments of films, there's always something that can be savored if we can look for the nuance. The horror in the ending of Sleepaway Camp is not that Angela was assigned male at birth. The horror is recognizing that we've been watching a child who has been abused and mentally tortured for years, and that this child is in desperate need of help.